Wow, it's great to be. You, you have chairs. Sit down. Don't stand up here. You that don't have chairs, get here early next time. What a wonderful place this is. William Jewell College. Isn't this beautiful? In Liberty. Liberty, Missouri. I don't know who named this wonderful city, but naming it Liberty certainly is appropriate. What a wonderful reminder this is of what makes America such a unique nation. It's, uh, it's our liberty, the freedom to live our lives as we, uh, as we choose, to have a government that protects our liberty rather than taking it away from us. Wouldn't that be nice to bring that again back to the United States of America? I've had a lot of fun. I have to be honest with you. This has been fun. I didn't imagine I was going to be running for president. When I was a boy, I wanted to be a policeman. And when I got a little older, I wanted to do what my dad did. He was a business guy in the car industry. And uh, somehow I backed into this. I, I, you know, I was in business for 25 years. And then I went on and helped run the Olympics and got in trouble. And after that, that was a real thrill, I have to tell you. Uh, after that, I, I came back to my state of Massachusetts and was able to run for governor and help get that state on track. And somehow I got the opportunity to run for president. And this has given me the chance to go across the country and meet everyday Americans. You know, the people you see on the news every night, they've usually done something unusual to get on the news. Typically not a good thing. And, and, and so I get the chance to see people, not on the news, but as they live their lives across the country. And I come away encouraged, and at the same time, feeling the need to make a real change in Washington, fast. I'm encouraged because I meet people who are, uh, despite facing tough times, are not despondent. And who, who recognize that the, the good times will come in the future, that believe in the future. They're concerned about what's happening right now. They're concerned about high gas prices. They're concerned about low job growth. They're concerned about low wages. They're concerned about home values that oftentimes are underwater. They believe this president has failed them, and he has, and that's why we're going to replace him in 2012. I, I heard something unusual the other day. He, he has a filmmaker, a documentarian, so to speak. He really makes infomercials for the president. He put this, I think it was a 17-minute infomercial together, and he said it was hard putting together a film like this because he couldn't find anything negative, no, no, nothing you could criticize about the president. And I thought, well, you could call one of the 24 million people that are out of work or underemployed in this country. That, that might help you out. Uh, you know, or, or you could call anybody who's tired of paying almost $4 a gallon for gasoline. You could do that. And, and you could call anybody who's under, uh, let's say, under 15, who's worried about paying back $15.5 trillion of debt. You could call those people, and you'd understand the things the president's done wrong. Those things we've got to fix and fix fast for the American people. This, uh, the president made some promises when he was a candidate. He said he was going to cut the deficit in half. Remember that one? He's doubled it. He said that if we let him borrow $787 billion, that he would hold unemployment below 8%. 8% was a high number. 8% was a ceiling. That was his, his mark. It has not been below 8% since. He said he'd cut taxes for middle-income Americans. Your taxes down? No, no. As a matter of fact, your costs have gone up in part because of Obamacare, one of the worst ideas he came up with. We got to get rid of that one. The president's failed. He, he has failed. He's not a bad guy. He just is over his head. We need to get someone in Washington, not of Washington, someone who's come from the real economy, who understands why jobs leave, why they come back, who will get America working again. I spent my life in the private sector. I have not been, been employed by Washington. I've been employed in the private sector like you have. I want to use that experience to get America working again and solve the challenges of this great nation. This president, this president's out of ideas, and he's out of excuses. And so in 2012, we got to make sure he's out of office. That's your job. The course we would take is very different. I hope you understand just how different the nation will be if I'm president than if he's president. First of all, 
He'll appoint justices who continue to believe their job is to legislate for the bench. If I'm president, I will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will follow the Constitution and follow the law and not follow any other direction. If he's president, if he's president, you could expect trillion dollar deficits every one of the next four years, and at some point, we would hit a grease-like wall. If I'm president, we will cut federal spending, we will cap federal spending, and we'll finally get to a balanced budget. And, and by the way, now and then I'm asked, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to cut spending? And, and, and I have three, three rules. Number one, I'm going to look at every program and ask, is this program so essential it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if it doesn't pass that test, I'm getting rid of it. So Obamacare, goodbye. Subsidies for Amtrak and for Planned Parenthood, those things, goodbye. Even PBS. I like, look, I like PBS. I've got to be honest. I like PBS. But we, we borrow money so that PBS doesn't have to show advertising to our kids. Well, Big Bird's going to have to get used to Kellogg's Corn Flakes because we're going to have to have advertising or bigger donations. We, we're, we just can't keep on borrowing money and passing on those burdens to our kids. It's, I think it's, uh, it's bad economics. I think it's immoral for us to pass on our burdens to the next generation. So number one, we're going we're gonna to cut programs. Number two, we're going to take a lot of programs that are essential, our programs for the poor, like uh, Medicaid and, and food stamps and housing vouchers. And instead of having them run out of the federal government, I'm going to send them back to the states where the states can run them with less fraud and more economically. And for the federal government that's left, I'm going to reduce employment through attrition by about 10% or more. And then I'm going to link the pay of government workers with the pay and benefits that exist in the private sector. I don't think government workers should get paid more than the people who are paying the taxes for them. Now, how about something like energy? This president is, uh, is doing his very best to, uh, to find someone to blame. I mean, that is his first instinct. It's interesting how when something goes wrong, I mean, you, you know that you, you stand up and take responsibility. That's what you do in life. You say, well, I made a mistake. And then people say, OK, we'll, we'll forgive you. In this case, no, no, his, his first response is always to find someone to blame. And, and, and he's had to look long and hard because the American people know he was the one that said no to the Keystone Pipeline. The American people know he was the one that said no to, to continuing to drill offshore in the deep water drilling in the Gulf. The American people know that he was the one that's been holding up getting natural gas out of the ground in Marcellus Shale. They, they know what he's been doing. And so he had to look long and hard. He came up with a new one. He said because Republican candidates, because Republican candidates are talking about being tough on Iran for pursuing nuclear weapons, that's caused gas prices to go up. Now you try and connect those dots, all right? This, and, and it's, it's, a, uh, it's a cynical thing to take something as important as, as our foreign policy as it relates to Iran, to a nation looking to become nuclear, the state sponsor of terror, Hamas, Hezbollah, conceivably having nuclear fissile material they could use against us even here. And we talk about that in serious terms that he somehow wants to make that a matter of gasoline prices. My goodness, Mr. President, recognize your own mistakes and admit them. And if you do that, we can finally start drilling for oil, drilling for gas, using nuclear, using coal, and get America energy secure like I will get it. There, there, are, there are other differences. This president seems to... Uh, well, he's sort of fallen uh, captive to the idea of, of what I call crony capitalism. The idea is instead of letting markets and consumers decide which products to have, why he thinks that he and his bureaucrats could do better telling us how to live our lives. Obviously, in healthcare, they, they want to give you Obamacare to tell you how, how, what kind of insurance you can have, what it has to include, what kind, of, what kind of treatments you can receive. First thing I'll do day one, I'm going to eliminate Obamacare. We're going to get rid of it by giving a waiver to every state. And then, then he says he's for green jobs. That means he's taking your green and giving it to his friends, all right? And, and so, he, so he gives money to Solyndra and to Fisker and to Tesla and to uh, Enter One. And the, these, are, these are, in some cases, people who've given money to his campaign. They get money from the government. And, and, and that, of course, distorts the nature of our free market system. 
It has not worked. It's cost us money. If I'm president of the United States, we're going to stop this kind of uh, crony capitalism and instead return to free market principles that make our economy thrive and create jobs. Let me, let me mention another difference. And that, that relates to uh, our national defense. I, I don't know whether you know the, the, the status of our, of our military and whether you watch it as closely as, as you might. Um, you might be surprised to hear that our Navy is smaller now than any time since 1917. And the President's plan is to continue to reduce the size of our Navy. Our Air Force is older and smaller than any time since it was founded in 1947. And the President plans to continue to reduce our purchases of new aircraft. You know the status of our troops, our active duty personnel and our reservists and National Guardsmen and women were, were on multiple rotations in these last conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. And yet the President's plan is to shrink our active duty personnel even further. And those of you who are veterans know that the TRICARE, the payments that you're required to make are supposed to go up in TRICARE. It seems the only place the President's willing to cut spending is the one place we shouldn't cut spending, which is our national defense. And so, and by the way, I know there's a lot of waste in the Department of Defense, and I want to go after that waste and make it more efficient, but I want to use the dollars we find in waste and use them to buy more ships, buy more airplanes, get an additional 100,000 troops, and give the veterans the care our veterans deserve. This is a choice for America about what kind of nation we're going to have, whether we're going to have a strong military devoted to protecting freedom. I happen to believe that a strong American military is the best ally peace has ever known. We need a strong military, a strong military, a superior military, one that no nation in the world would ever think of testing. That is the best course for our, our security and our preservation and our liberties. And that's the kind of course that I'm going to pursue. We're, we're going to either have a president who, who puts in place trillion dollar deficits and leads us toward Greece or a president that stops the outrageous spending and leads us towards a brighter future. We're going to either have, have a president who, who continues to practice crony capitalism or a president whose economic plans create jobs. Look, the president has this extraordinary tax plan, which he, he announced. I actually say extraordinary because of what it would do to jobs in this country. He wants to raise something known as the marginal tax rate from 35% to 40%. Now, private sector workers in America work for businesses taxed at the individual level. And so when you raise that tax rate from 35 to 40%, you kill jobs and you kill income growth. I want to lower that tax rate from 35% to 28%. I want to cut marginal tax rates for everyone across the board, 20%, because I'm going to put Americans back to work in good jobs. I think, I think our president takes his political inspiration from the social democrats of Europe and thinks that their policies are, are better over there. Well, they've got high unemployment and low wage growth and low productivity growth. I don't think Europe is working in Europe, and I'll never bring Europe policies here to the United States of America. My view, my view is the right course for America is not to become like Europe, but instead to restore the principles that made America the economic engine of the world and the most powerful nation in the history of humankind. I love this country. I love its beauty. I love the people of the country. Get a chance to meet people every day. It's so much fun. So inspiring. I, uh, I believe that the words of the founders of this country were not only brilliant, but, but inspired. When the founder said that we were given our rights by the creator, not by the state, not by the king, but by the creator, they changed the world with that observation. And, and then they said among those rights are life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By, by virtue of the liberty, freedom lovers came here from all over the world. By virtue of that little phrase, the pursuit of happiness, they said in America, we would be free to choose our course in life, not as the government directs, but as our heart inspires. 
And so for centuries, people have come here seeking freedom, seeking the opportunity to build a better future, recognizing that government won't set their course, that, that the circumstance of birth will not limit them. It's who we are. It's what made us who we are. And this president has a different view. He thinks government makes us what we are. That is not the case. It is free people pursuing their dreams, taking risks, getting education, raising their kids for a better future. That's what makes us who we are. The American people are the source of our strength. It's time to give them their freedoms back. We've got work to do. I need you guys to caucus, all right? You got Saturday, you're gonna to come together for a caucus. I need you to get out there and vote for me. I want your vote because of one simple thing. I love America, I'm gonna get it fixed. And the simple thing I was gonna mention is this, because I'm the one guy in this race who can beat Barack Obama. And we gotta get him out of office, you know that? We gotta get that job done. So you guys, we got work to do. I want to thank you. This is a great and powerful movement across the country. We've had millions of people join our cause. States, delegates are lining up behind this campaign to take America back, to restore our freedoms, to keep us the shining city on a hill. I will do it with your help. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.